right? But today's, today we just decided, or Harshana decided, to uh, rather than having a workout, let's, let's spend a little bit more time on the mental aspect of the game, um, which, which we always incorporate into our practices. Um, and, and, and I feel like everybody is doing some sort of the work, whether it's intentional or not. Um, but having the chance to actually sit down and have a conversation about it is, is, is a rare opportunity. You know, and uh, we would like to keep the discussion open. It is a fairly small group. Uh, feel free to write something in, into the chat or, or just unmute yourself and, and, and ask, ask a question. question or share some of your experiences. And, um, you know, no judgment here. We have all had ups and lows on, 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 the, on the tennis score, so just feel free to to put anything out there. Um, the mental aspect of the game is, is a really wide, wide range of topic. So when Harshana and I were preparing for this, we decided to focus on a few main ideas such as focus and distraction control, um, realistic performance evaluation, and self-awareness. Uh, just like with many other things on the court, it is it is hard to talk about about anything in isolation because everything is connected to everything else on the court. Like think about implementing a strategy on the court. You cannot really implement strategies on the court without having um, having the technical part of it. So, for example, uh, you want to hit the ball deeper. That's your strategy, trying to push your opponent back while you need the longer follow through. Um, pretty much anything you do on the court relates back to the mental aspect. Right? And just to clarify, these are kind of the main big um, areas, uh, aspects of tennis, of tennis development on the court. There is the physical part, which includes basic things like running, jumping, and anything physical on the court. Uh, there is the technical part, with, which is like how you hold the racket, how you swing, how you position your feet. Uh, there is the tactical part of what you actually do on the court. There is the competitive part, which is everybody has to learn that, like how to compete. And then there is the, the mental aspect of it, and sometimes it gets combined with the emotional. Um, social emotional aspect of of the game um harshana anything you want to add to the intro it's a good intro that's a great intro <laughs> before we we get a little bit deeper into it and and again feel free to put anything into the chat and and ask questions um like let let, let, let me start start it by um one of the, the, the that was a coach. I, I didn't really get to know him very well. He was kind of traveling through with the player, and I got to an English coach, and I got to sit down to have a beer with him, um, and and he took out this napkin, and he started to say like he asked me to tell any anything that I think a tennis player needs. So I just started to throw things out there like. You know, like a, a tennis player has to be fit and you can break that down into multiple parts, like uh, the different part, parts of fitness. Like you got to be flexible, you got to be coordinated, your cardio, strength, power, or all of that. Um, you got you to gotta have, uh, you, you got to be able to access the courts. You got to, uh, you have to have good technique. You got to have a solid, you know, all the shots. You got to have, have serves. You, maybe you are not, um, maybe you don't come to the net very often, but in order to play doubles and to be a more complete player, you have to be able to hit volleys. So eventually, just put a bunch of things down on a napkin, and eventually he put attitude into the middle and just drew a line from each of those into attitude, just saying that everything, everything we do out there, 
goes back into attitude. So if the attitude, and if there's no, that, that there is no positive attitude, there is no um, excitement, there is no energy, if the mindset is not there, then probably learning will not take place. So you can look at, look at everything that we do on the court, everything that you're trying to achieve on the court, you're trying to change or um, improve on the court, goes back into to, to attitude. In order to make progress, the positive attitude has to be there. Yeah, to piggyback on that, um, you guys must have heard already that there's only two things on the court you can control. Number one is attitude, as, as Martin said, and number two is effort. Those are the only two things you can you have complete control of. Many other things are very vague. You know, it's, it depends on the day, it depends on how good your effort is, depends on your attitude, you might be able to control it. So whatever you do like on court, those two things has to be consistent at all time. During practice, during matches, during fitness, anything you do. So really keep that in mind that those two things, attitude and your effort has to be good at all time. Positive attitude always. I mean, even if you're, even if you're losing, you got to think of learning something out of it instead of thinking, oh no, I'm losing, you know? And, and think of every loss as a lesson. Every time you lose, you're learning, right? Every time you win, you're gaining confidence. That's it. Every time you win doing something, you're super confident. Yes, I can do this. I can do this over and over again. I'm confident of doing it. And when you go to the next match, you take that confidence with you. But when you lose, you don't take that negativity to the next match. You only take the positive aspect of it. Okay, I made this mistake on this situation. I'm trying not to make that mistake this time. I went through too far to the lines in that match. I'm trying to have bigger margins this time. So really making sure that you are aware of what's going on, then then really getting getting carried away with the result. A lot of the times, I think all of us have have faced that challenge of um, really getting carried away with with uh, the result. Like before we get on court, we're already thinking about the result, um, and that's 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 not a good way to start a match. You know, you you're starting a match thinking, "Hey, I'm going on court. My opponent can play tennis. I can play tennis too." Right, but on this given day, whoever manages themselves well is probably going to be the winner in this match. And majority of the time, you guys play matches against people who are like kind of similar to your level. So on that given day, it's a lot about it's a lot about how you manage yourself. So um, really focusing on what you can do, what you can't do, and being clear with it helps you to get on a match. Um, I mean, the other day I was talking to having a conversation with one of the mental trainers, I was telling him that uh, usually, I don't know, this is my opinion. When I usually go on court, regardless who I play with, it doesn't matter who's on the other side of the court. I'm only focusing on myself for the first few games because before I start controlling my opponent, I have to settle down, right? So the first four games is all about me focusing on getting my serves in, making my returns, getting my forehand cross court, getting the feel of my backhand, doing a couple of slices, doing, going up to net and make, taking some volleys. And all, I, all I'm doing is just settling myself in. Because every any given day, like you play outside, it might be windy, sunny, whatever. Like every, every there are so many things that are, that are going to come into play. And you might play with balls that you're not used to, right? At Sportsman's, we play with Pro Pen with all the clinics, but you might go for a tournament and play with a Wilson ball. It's slightly different. So those are those are some of the intangibles that you gotta get get adjusted to before actually playing your game. So when you go on court thinking about really settling in, that'll keep you way more relaxed than really thinking about oh, now how how am I gonna win this? How am I gonna how am I, what what do I have to do to win? So all that anxiety is going to go away to start the match itself, being just really calm and thinking about what you're good at. What can I do? I just have to get used to my game. I just have to get used to my forehand. If my forehand is a weapon, I'm going to try to hit more forehands in the rally just to get, just to get uh, settled in, right? And um, I mean, 
even even when you're when you're returning your only focus is to get that returning that's it because you just have to get used to your opponent's serve to get get uh, get in the rhythm of it and now you can start making better better returns as the match goes on so really being having a mindset of settling in and really feeling the ball feeling your opponent getting getting adjusted to all the weather conditions and what not keeps you more relaxed when you go on a match than actually thinking about the end yeah right? the yeah. the end should not come into play at all you play a game at a time you might be 5 love 40 love up but if you don't win that point the match is not over it can still turn around so always don't think about the end just focus on the process focus on what you can what you can control Yeah. What are you talking yeah. about something? Yeah. I see that I just a couple of things before answering to Rachel's question there. Um you know you mentioned the effort and attitude and again those two things I I think many times it's really hard to separate those two because you know the your effort often on the court especially when you perform often your it shows in your effort. Right? It's like it's 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 really when you're bouncing on your feet when you got that explosive first step um you know when 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 your 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 head is up shoulders back you're ready to go you know that it it kind of your that's almost like a body language for for your attitude and you can you can call call that effort um and Rachel was asking um are there any differences in mindset if you're winning versus if you're losing and you know in tennis so many times the the answer is that it depends and it depends because tennis tennis is a sport where you are playing against a moving ball everything is is always changing except the serve the serve is you're essentially trying to do the same thing over and over again but everything else they call it an open skill sport so it's the the height the 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 depth the the speed of the ball is always different so you have to adjust and it really depends who is on the other side of the net um and just like Harshana was saying um you going to differentiate you you have to focus on on the on the process on the process is how you play what you can do to to do better you can't really focus on the score you can't but that's that's the outcome you can really you know the the outcome is is what what the outcome is you have to look at what is the next best thing you can do in in order to in order to play better because that's what you can influence um and you know w- w- winning versus losing it it really depends on on the level on the level of the two players assuming they are on the same level you can always start with asking yourself am i moving well enough and there's something that you would often see coaches um coaches look at instead of saying that okay here is the shot and i'm looking at your racket um i'm i'm not really lo- lo- looking at your racket first i'm not really looking at your swing your contact point first um but but most coaches would look at your footwork first is your positioning good enough and there's something that players on all levels constantly try to improve and better yeah um to add to that i think one of the points we were martin and i discussed was what type of routines and rituals do you have you know i mean most of you i mean all of us have different routines and i think building routines before matches routines between points routines in the changeover would really help you calm down and not overthink about the match right i mean of course every every game whatever happened in the game you got to take the positive moving forward and but if you always always have a good routine like especially in changeovers your mind can go all over the place in the changeover so um, it's always helpful to have routines um could be anything you know everybody has different routines you know some people look at the strings some people just look down some people just look up at the sky and the trees and what not um it all depends whatever that works for you so it's 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 more of like a how do you say a trial and error thing you know you got to try certain things and whatever works for you 
I mean, for me personally, when I was when I was younger, um, it took a while to really get used to it. And I, what I once one coach told me actually was to not look at people. When you look at people, you your emotions come into play because every person has a different emotion. Especially if you look, miss an easy ball and look at somebody, that someone goes like, "Oh no." And then you look at that person, like you put yourself down. So I try myself, try my best to not look at people um, simply because it really affects my, affects my mental uh, part of my game. And uh, I look at trees, birds, clouds, things that brings me, bring me to present so that I forget the past. I forget those mistakes and I move forward. I obviously think about what can I do better? Um, but I try not to uh, look at people as much as possible. Um, that's that's something uh, I do as a routine between points. And even in the changes, I try not to. Um, and, and also, do you want to you wanna jump into a Ruth's question? Sure. Um, you know, and, and to add, add to yours is that routine is something by definition that, that, that we do every single time. Right? Mm-hmm. It is not really a routine if you only do it when you're playing a match. Yeah. So if, if it's a routine of how you walk up to, to the baseline to serve or to return, you have to practice that. Just like you're practicing your ground strokes and your technique, that's something, some, something that players should, should practice. And, and just like Hoshima said, it's, you can experiment with it. What works for you the best? Are you trying to go a little bit faster pace? Are you trying to slow things down a little bit? You know, what, 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 what is it that, that works for you? Are, you? are you bouncing the ball once and you're ready to serve? Or are, are you going to bounce it 10 times and, and take your time on it? Right? It, it really depends on, on the person. Um, Let me pause real quick. Talking about the serve, um, I think one mistake I see a lot of, a lot of the kids and adults when we when we practice serve is that all of us we rush through serves when we're practicing right when we're practicing we're rushing through serves thinking oh i want to get the most serves today before i go home but actually you don't serve that fast in a match but when you go to the match you probably bounce as as martin said you might bounce five six times when you're playing a match but in practice you don't bounce at all you just straight up go up just serve you go up just serve but that's not part of your routine so building those routines happens in the practice court. So every serve you do every single day is a part of your routine. That's how you build the routine. You can't build the routine just in the match only. So next time when you go on court, when you're serving, focus on the routine. You got to have a routine. If you're bouncing as Martin said, if you're bouncing four or five times, whatever. I mean, Jokovic sometimes bounces 20 times. You know, it happens. It depends on the person. But it, if whatever that works for you, you know, it's, uh, it has to whatever that helps you get your mind back to back to reset and start the next point you reset start the next point so mm-hmm. practice that in the practice code itself so Harshan, what would you suggest to somebody who finds herself in a situation uh, in a tight match where she keeps going back into kind of playing defensive playing too safe even though understanding right coming from ruth on understanding that 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 um she, 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 she could be more, more, more aggressive. It's a clear answer. It's, you're, you're basically, that happens is when you're playing not to lose. If you play not to lose, you're playing too safe. Right? Lose or win, play to win. Right? If you play to win, at least you did things in your terms. But if you're, if you're playing not to lose, you're basically reacting to what your opponent does, right? And this is where it's important to understand what you are good at. When you, you got to know what your strengths and weaknesses are, especially when it comes to tiebreakers. You're only playing your best shots in the tiebreakers. You're not taking high, high, big risks. No, nope. you're not playing around with any other, any other shots you've never tried in the whole match, right? Um, I mean, if you're like 5-2 or 6-2 up, like you have a set point, whatnot, oh yeah, you might do something that you haven't done just to try out because you have a good margin there of like four or five points. But this is, this is really helpful to know what you're good at and what, what weaknesses you have. And anytime you're, you feel like in a point that you're, you're in a weaker position, get the ball in, right? And work your way. I mean, it, 
it's it, it comes with a lot of patience and also just understanding what you're good at and what you're what you're not that good at knowing your strengths and weaknesses makes a big difference when it comes to uh, bigger points and bigger situations in matches um i mean most of the good players they are very clear about what they are good at what they are good at and they only play their best tennis when it comes to bigger points i mean tennis is all about winning big points it's not about how many points you win in a row it's about winning those big points at 40 30 30 40 advantage you know those tie breakers those those big points is what counts so if you if you're really clear about what you're good and bad at uh, it's so much easier to play bigger points and you're more calmer too because you're not like overthinking of what you should do because you're very clear about what you're good at and and the areas you need to you need to work on and i would also encourage all of you to be intentional about practicing that so put yourself in a situation and in a in practice where where you are go, going go, going for 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 your shots you know um when you when you play a sportsman so often there's somebody um when you're playing your your league matches there is somebody who is watching you know you can ask ask for for that feedback and sometimes it is hard to hard to know where you are um so so they can provide you that external feedback and and you can go for your shot just go for for 5% more than where you feel comfortable with you know obviously you shouldn't feel like you're going for your 100% but see if you can push your limit by go, going just 5 to 10% more uh, than what you feel comfortable with especially in practice and think about some of the games that 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 we play in practices um like let's say when when we ask you to play a set and start every every game from 30 40 right and sometimes even start it with a second serve right it means that a set every a set will be about 10 minutes or less every point every point you play is either a game point or a break point or both it is a mental game right it's a 10 minute thing so probably you will not get too exhausted so it's not too physical um there is some strategy to it right? obviously you don't want to overplay but it is really really a mental game it is a problem um an adverse situation that is presented to you and you have to find a solution you know and putting yourself in this challenging positions right, will help you to 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 get through some of the challenging situations in matches talking about practice matches i think also what we all can get better at is not being not thinking too much about winning when you're playing practice matches right when you're playing practice matches it's all about doing the things you practice you you good at and you practice it if you fail on that day and the practice match it doesn't matter you're not getting trophies if you win a practice match right so your goal is to win the matches win the matches at a tournament um or a cmit or what not but when you're playing practice practice matches simply try things simply get better at things that you want to improve on and don't be don't be scared to do it and uh, i mean we would applaud anybody who's going to go out there and do things that we practiced on and fail than just not doing th- the things we practice at all so it's again it's the mind thing it's about you making out making your mind up saying okay today i'm just going to do exactly what we practiced on right and and everything needs repetition the more repetitions you do more times you try it'll happen in a match and it'll happen without thinking too much in a match it's hard to think too much and make it happen in a match you know it's all these repetitions has to happen from a practice court so every every practice match you lose it's okay you're losing trying something you're losing while improving right but if you if you think of winning winning only when you're playing practice matches you're not really improving that much so even the same mindset has to be in practice matches too just the process just the process going through your routines doing the things you like to do trying to win points the way you want to win instead of really react be playing as a being like a reactive opponent reacting to everything what your opponent does you know so and hoshan what you are describing is pretty much is the different phases of learning and there is yeah. a new concept that's being introduced whether it's a skill uh, an idea that's being introduced 
and usually at the beginning there is a quick um, accelerated learning phase where you're it's new you're picking up fast and there is a long phase of of trying to master that skill mm -hmm. whether it's a physical it's a mental skill and then at the end you know that you own it when you don't think about it when you're playing that tiebreaker you're playing the tiebreaker, you don't think about it, you have it, you own it, you're, you're, you're just executing. It, it's happening kind of automatically. It's not something that you have to think about. You know, and, and that, can be, that can be a goal for some of you that in those big moments, in those tiebreakers, you know, learning, le le learning how to let loose. And having a routine, um, having a routine that you put your, your racket into your non-dominant hand in between points, shake your arms off so your shoulder relaxes so, so you can actually swing at your shots. You know, those, th those little things can, can, can re really help. That's a good point because I'm like a OC, I'm pretty OCD about that because I even, I don't, before when, I, when I'm in the middle of tournaments, I don't even, lift a cup from my left hand. I do everything from my right hand. I'm basically letting my left hand rest as much as possible. I carry the bag from my right hand. I, I lift the water bottle from my right hand, everything. Even between points, as Martin said, I do that too, just to rest my arm. Because I feel like every bit of energy helps when the match gets longer. Yeah. I mean, it could be a mental thing, but you know. And I'm sure at, at the beginning, I'm sure at the beginning it was, you needed constant reminders and it's like, oh yeah. man, I, I just pick, pick something up with my left hand again. But eventually, eventually uh, you learned it and, and yeah. it was subconscious. Yeah. It was automatic. All right, Alexa has a, a question. I read in Tennis Magazine about Andreas Kui using anger to compete, thoughts. Um, usually, usually a lot of people a lot of players play bad when they're mad, uh, but there's very few people who use that anger as, as positive energy. And that's something you can practice too. I mean, a lot of us, when, they, when we get mad, we can't think straight. We get, we get carried away and just, we just do things that we've never done because we just want to get, get the point over because we are so stressed and you know thinking about uh, winning the point as soon as possible. But I mean, she's one of the, one of the few who really makes it makes it you know i mean gives up getting herself to be super positive using that by using that anger um i think i think i mean that's 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 the that's the explanation i can give you i mean it depends on the person some people are some people can turn negative uh, energy into positivity but some people can't uh, but you can definitely practice on 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 turning it to positive energy definitely that's for sure yeah. i had a conversation um a while back with one of the rugby players. I mean, think of American football, right? If, if in American football, someone's mad, they're going to tackle you hard, like really, really hard to take that anger out. But in tennis, it's different. You know, sometimes you can, you want to hit the ball as hard as you can, but you might, you barely make balls in. So it's, it's, it's a little different in, in tennis. So it's, you got to still be calm and use it in a positive way, but in a contact sport, it's different. A lot of people use that, um, uh, anger to uh, compete harder i mean anger management i think generally is 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 hard and just like anything else it can be learned some some players learn it faster for some la players it takes takes for a long time um and, and what you said harshana you know it's like there is that energy you're trying to get the most out of you uh, uh you're you're trying to to push yourself as hard as you can uh, and some days, some, some, some days, even professionals, they get out there and they just don't have it. So they're trying everything they can. They, 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 they try to move. They try to jump around. They try to, uh, I don't know, slap their thighs. And who, who was that? Was it Yusni who used to like hit his, oh, yeah, hit his, hit, hit his head? I like kind of just trying to get, 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 get himself going. You know, it's like some of them get like semi-violent by, by hit, hitting the strings and their uh, knuckles are, 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 are bleeding. And most players cannot, can, cannot perform well, um, you know, while, while they are really angry. And, and a few are able to channel that, that energy into their game. 
Um, and I've also seen players where I, I felt like it was just a show. They just put up a show to make, make themselves go and, and to bring that energy into, into the game. And inside, they, 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 they were quite calm. And you could sense that um, in between, in between the, the games and the changeovers, you could sense that when they would come off the court and, 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 and have a conversation. And also to uh, add to that, if you're on the receiving end, so for example, if I'm playing a match against Winston and Winston's on the other side of the court and Winston's getting mad, like really mad. I'm really focused, but he's getting really mad. But that can disturb me as well, right? If I'm focusing on what he's doing, him throwing his racket and him screaming, that can throw me off as well. Some people might do it just to throw other people off. You know, it could be a strategical thing too. But for some, for most, it's not. But uh, you got to be careful if you're on the receiving end. You should not even look at your opponent because every time you look at look at him or her, like it's it's gonna really affect you because you're like, oh, he's throwing the racket. Oh, he's screaming. Like you should literally look at look look the other way. If he's like having an argument with the umpire, it's none of your business. Don't even look at it. It's no point. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, some people would do it to uh, disturb you. Some people would do it, you know, just just because they're mad, you know. Uh, but it can it can work in their favor sometimes, depending on who's on the other side of the court. Yeah. I mean, what what are the things that are under your control, and what are the things that are not under your control? You know, your opponent throwing a tantrum is 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 not really under your control. So don't don't get involved in it. It, it, it will probably not help you. You know, you um, being more explosive with your feet, you taking a little bit more time before the serve, um, you, um, I don't know, attacking the net, again, the process that you can focus on, those are the things that, that, that will really help you. Rachel, I'll come back to your question. Vincent, you said, so you're saying that acting part can still make people uncomfortable and a strategy? Trust me, people do that. A uh, okay. lot of players do that. Yeah. You will come across in your career in tennis, you will come across people who does things just to throw you off. Simply. I mean, it could be a hundred different things. They would do it to throw you off. Um, so just just be aware. You know, you just have to be aware that these things are going to happen, but that should not affect you. Okay. So, it, it is a skill. It is a skill that yeah, you can learn skill. how to ignore. And it is an important skill. It is yeah. an important skill how to how to ig ignore um, some somebody purposely distracting you, and hopefully all of the juniors here will play college tennis. And if you think that USD is bad, wait until you get to college, because there, um, coaches, assistant coaches are allowed to come on the course, so you can have. Four, four additional people on the court. You will have all the, all, all the other players in the team who are not playing might be right next to your court. And when you're playing an away match, let's say some of the roommates and friends will come out and watch and cheer and they have no idea about tennis. So they will cheer like it will be a, a basketball game and, and you know, say not too kind things to you while you are let's say, tossing the ball up to serve. And you just have to, have to ignore it. And it goes back to um, one of our main points, the focus and distraction control. Practice, practice that, ignore that. That's why, you know, we are really big on not having a cell phone on, on, on the court. No, it's, it's, it's a distraction. It, it doesn't help, help you right there and then. Let's, let's, not, let's not use that cell phone. You know, when, uh, when we are playing matches as sportsmen, we try to do it in a way that is similar to a tournament. You know, you should act that way, change the scoreboard, change sides. So that, that, is, that is a fam familiar thing. And, and, and practice, pra pra practice those habits and routines, like, like not paying attention to your opponent when your opponent is, is distracting you. I mean, talking about uh, making noise when they serve, I think 
I think I've done it to all of these kids, except for the adults. Every time you guys get over it, I used to make the farting sound. <laughs> I do it every single time when I see it. Every single time. I'm sure I've done it to each one of you. And all of you guys get like, like look at, looking at me like, what are you doing? Like, it doesn't matter. I'm on the other court. I can make any sound I want. You guys are on the court. You just got to focus on the ball. It's, it's something outside um, the fences. I personally, as the adult, feel left out. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, I just haven't done it with the adults. I'll do it. For, I'll yeah. do it to you next time, Alexa. Don't worry. I love that. Oh, okay. All right. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I remember a friend of mine was telling me how in India, when they are playing Fed Cup and Davis Cup, people would go out, and when the opponent is serving, apparently everybody tosses up a shiny coin, hoping uh, that the sun would would kind of reflect into oh my God, the, into the ser servers. So, so wow. advice, you know, and imagine thousands of people doing that at the same time. Um, I once had a person who was actually coughing purposely. Yeah. At a Davis Cup match. I mean, this was a, an organizer. She had an official tag on her and she was coughing every time. And I mean, I knew she was coughing, but uh, I just played it a little smarter because I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. I didn't tell the umpire because if the umpire, I tell the umpire, people would see me complaining and the umpire is going to make an announcement and people are going to be even more against me. This is outside of Sri Lanka. Um, so I went and told the captain, <laughs> captain of their, their team to tell this lady that that's not right. Um, but I mean, I just played it safe because I didn't want, the crowds are already, already against me. I didn't want them to like even go, go even crazier. But it's going to happen at any level, especially in college, big time. Tons of people will try to come and disturb you. It's endless. So you got to put yourself, again, you got to put yourself mentally in a room with four walls. It's just you and your opponent. That's it. Everything, everything outside the walls is, it's, it's none of your business. You should not even, not even listen to it. You should not even hear or see it. Nothing. It's, 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 it's outside stuff that, that is uh, not part of your part of your match. Remember, at the end of the day, your your end goal is to win the match. So you're doing everything you can, everything in your control, to help you win the match. That's it. Right? And there'll be so many distractions. There'll be people trying to distract you. There's, I don't know, random noises that's going to distract you. Your plane flying by or whatever. But um, you got to channel everything to help you win the match. That's the goal. That's your end goal. So, all right, you want to jump to the next question? Yeah. Rachel. Any ideas for how to practice these techniques now that we can play, like when we are doing running or conditioning? No. I mean, to you want to take it? Yeah, I mean, to start, start with, I, I love run, running. Um, it is, it is to, to, to me by far a lot more of a mental thing then it is a physical thing. A physical part, I feel like for, for, for me, it's like a, a side effect. It's, it's really, it's, it's my time, my own time, um, when I'm focusing on, on myself. Um, and and, and by, by the way, it, it, is, it, it is a physical thing. And to, to kind of how to have the distraction, I mean, I, I, th I think with running and conditioning, especially at home, um, I always find that there's always a reason to stop. There's always a reason why we shouldn't do it today or right now. And, but to, to be able to commit, to commit to a regular schedule and do it and getting through it and not stopping um, and get, getting the best out of yourself when you finish and you can say that, yeah, I did my best. I left nothing on the table. Um, that that I, I feel like that that is hard, and that that is a good way to practice um, some of the things that we are talking about. And uh, Rachel, about techniques, practicing technique technique now that we can physically play. I think all you can do is shadow movements. You know, shadow shadow with the swings, shadow with the footwork. I mean, if you have a wall to hit against, phenomenal. That's like the best thing you can have. Um, I mean, any any time you're at home, you can practice, no problem at all. 
and that'll that'll straight away relate to what you do on the tennis court. But if you don't have a wall, it's it's more about shadow swings and uh, shadowing footwork. Um, I mean, muscle memory. There's there's different levels of muscle memory. There's there's muscle memory on the swings. There's muscle memory on the movements. You know, I mean, you gotta you should practice both. It's not one or the other, and uh, both work work. Um, work together so it's always important to practice your swings as well as your footwork so it's mostly shadow stuff that's pretty much what you can do right now and you can also work on work on your feel doing a lot of bounces on the racket bouncing down bumping it up you know switching different ways doing the slices doing the slice bounce thing um, and lots of different ways to just keep the ball keep the feel on the ball on your racket um, even if you're not moving much um, but yeah, those are some of the few things you can do with very little space. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, assuming you don't have a wall. I mean, if you have a wall, there's lots of other things you can, you can do rallies, volleys, serves, everything. Um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, what you can do for technical stuff, uh, since you can't get on a court right now. Um, anything you want to add, Martin? Um, I, I think it's partially about the technique, but it was also like the kind of the mental technique um you know I, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly the which which, which part rachel which which part are you talking about the, the actual the the technique of of the shots or are you talking about the 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 mental um oh okay aspect, we, we have been talking and she said about. technique i thought it's the stroke yeah i mean by by, by the way on wednesdays i i try to um uh, run tomorrow i'm also run, running a little bit of uh, of a fitness slash tennis in your living room session. Um, I know some of you guys did that last Wednesday, and those are things that 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 you can also do on your own. You know, you don't have to wait for me to get on Zoom. You can you can do that on your own. And again, I, I find myself that once I'm doing it, it's fine. Getting getting things started is is the hard part. Um, and I always say that that is a mental thing. You know, to make, make make yourself do it. All right. So Rachel said, like, what we can do to build mental toughness now. So um, I think I think at this point, since you can't get on the court, um, I think the best thing you can do is visualize. And I think visualization can be pretty helpful um, when you're not on court. I mean, if you're on court, you got to be you got to visualize too. At this point, I think visualizing would help you a lot. And and watching tennis, you know, watching tennis and seeing seeing a lot of different different aspects of the game and how how some players handle themselves. You know, when you're watching a match, instead of following the ball too much, just follow a player and see what they do between points, and you know, see what they do in the changeovers, and um, and see what they do when they miss a ball, uh, see what they do when they hit a winner. You know, uh, so it's it's I think it's a lot about visualizing. Um, at this point to really, really focus on uh, mental toughness. And hey, meditation helps too. Uh, I mean, Marcel is doing uh, mindfulness and meditation sessions every, what, Tuesday? Every, every, every morning now. Now this week he's, he's doing every it morning. every morning at um, eight o'clock. But I mean, if you, can, if you can do that session with him and not get your mind off at all, I mean, that's huge it's, it's itself. Um, I mean, that says a lot that you can really control your mind and not let it vary um, all over the place. Uh, it's very easy, especially at home. I mean, you, there's so many things going on and you might think about that, this and everything. Um, but if you can do it at home and really keep your mind control, I think that's going to relate to the tennis court as well. Yeah. And, and there's also some, something that we often do not have enough time for. And, and it's, it's setting goals. You know, we didn't put, put it down here. Uh, for today's meeting, but that that is a big part of 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 um, I guess the psychology of of tennis and and part of development. If you can set set yourself goals, so by the time you come back, um, you have you you have a list of things that you would like to achieve, um, and and you can break those up, break those goals up. Um, into whether it's a mental thing you would like to get get better at, like um, like I think it was Ruth saying, like going for more, a little bit more 
in a tiebreaker in a tight situation or you would like to improve one of your shots putting things down on paper is 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 a lot harder you know then oh yeah i would like to get a better forehand no it's like that's not everybody would like to get a better forehand you know you would like you need to be more specific what about your forehand and you can start thinking about like what what does usually break down with the forehand whether you miss in the net, whether you don't go for it for big enough, you don't hit enough crossbows, and then start working backwards of like, okay, how can I address uh, hit, adding more height um, or more angle to my, to, to my forehand? And then you can, you can eventually come up with a goal um, that, that is very specific and say, I would like to hit a, sh um, I don't know, eight, be able to make eight out of 10, 10 forehand cross courts with at least three feet over the net. Um, I don't know where the ball is crossing the sideline before it's crossing the baseline, right? It's, 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 it's measurable, it's, it's very specific. And, 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 and then you can have that, have, have that as a goal. And this is a good time to, to, to come up with a, a reasonable list. Yeah. And, um... Also, I think also this is a good time to really, really think and really uh, differentiate your strengths and weaknesses. I think if you, if you really differentiate your strengths and weaknesses, as Martin said, it's very easy for you to set goals. Um, that'll really help you uh, differentiate your game. And in the future, you'll have a sense of, okay, I got to get better at this. But remember, you, when, you, when you differentiate those strengths and weaknesses, you don't want to only work on the weakness. You want to work on the strength as well. So as per visualizing, just focus really on how good can your strength be. And when you get back on court next, really make that strength like even better, you know? Um, so, you know, it's just really being clear in your mind, you know, what, what you're good at and what you're not, not so good at. I think writing it down would help you understand your game so much better. And in a match, it's so much good. It's going to be so much easier because you're clear. You know, okay, I'm good at this. I'm not so good at that. But when I get a ball to my weakness, I'm basically rallying the ball in. But when I get a ball to my strength, okay, I'm, I'm trying to do a little bit more with it. Uh, with good margin, I'm trying to hit a better quality ball. Uh, yeah, so I think it's a good time to set goals and, you know, write down your strengths and weaknesses. Bye, Alexa. Oh, sorry, Alexander and Justin. Sorry, my bad. Bye. <laughs> Tom has a question. Waiting to use Aussie formation for the first time on a deuce point as a way to throw off the opponent. All right. It can go both ways, right? If, you've, if you don't do enough Aussie formation and you are not used to it, it's going to throw you off before it throws your opponent, right? That's number one. First of all, you have to be you have to be very um, in sync with your partner and you have to be very comfortable doing the Aussie formation. Uh, if you are comfortable doing the Aussie formation, yes, definitely in a deuce point, you throw your opponents off. Yes, for sure. Uh, but it, you don't want to do an Aussie formation just because it's deuce. Oh my God, I've never tried this in the whole match and let me try it once. No, it's, I don't think uh, that's a good idea. So that, that way you're throwing yourself off. You don't want to do anything anything that you are not comfortable with in big points. That's the key, you know? Um, that usually, usually that happens as a panic. Like you're like panicking. Oh my God, I, wanna, I gotta win this point. And now you're trying to think, you're trying to be too creative and you end up doing something you're not even comfortable with. Like that's, that's a recipe for failure. Uh, okay, you might get lucky sometimes, but if you're on the long run, you're not gonna have the numbers in your favor. So you wanna make sure that if you're doing something like that in a big point, you that means you've done it enough in practice. I know Ruth has done it hundred times in practice because we've made her do it. I don't know about you, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's it's about being being <laughs> it's about being comfortable with uh, doing it. If you're comfortable, definitely throw them off in a deuce point. And also, if you come across a player who is really returning well, you want to do that too just to throw them off. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. And the Aussie formation right, is an Australian formation when in doubles, when both players are on the same side of the court. So imagine the, 
uh, the server serving from the do side and the server's partner is also on the do side. And it has, it can have multiple objectives. Let's say um, your opponent, the returner has a weaker side and you're challenging the returner to come up with that, with that shot um, down the line. Right? That, can be, that can be a reason to kind of put that, that will be just a way, a different way of putting pressure on, on your opponent. Um, and, and just simply keeping, keeping your opponent off, off balance. But I, I, I certainly agree with you, Arshan. You know, it's, 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 some, it's something that, 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 that you have to practice and definitely do, do, do it on, on the deuce point if you have practiced before. Um, I remember a personal experience when I first time I played on grass and, and uh, every, everybody was saying, yeah, serve and volley. Yeah, that's what you do on grass, serve and volley. So, you know, at, at least at the time, that's what people did. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, would, I would try to serve and volley, but uh, guess what? I, I grew up on red clay and I never served and volleyed before, really. I mean, here and there, somehow I ended up serving and volleying in some doubles matches, but on the most part, I never really served and volleyed. So it's, I didn't really have that strength. I didn't really have that skill. So I found myself playing a match on grass board um, but serving and bowling really didn't work for me because I, I never really practiced. I didn't really know how to do it. So maybe for somebody else, that, that, that would have been a really good strategy. Uh, but for me, it was definitely not because I did not have um, enough experience in it. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. You know, it's sometimes you might, sometimes in a situation, it might be the right thing to do, but if you're not comfortable doing it, it's probably not the right thing to do. Um, so it's a judgment call that you got to make um, based on the situation. I mean, so many people can tell you, oh, you have to serve and volley, blah, blah, blah. But hey, if you're not comfortable, it's on the right play. Maybe next time you go and practice and come back the next time you play on grass. But uh, you don't want to just uh, give up that whole match by, uh, by just doing it, doing something you're not comfortable with. Any other questions? Probably not. Yeah. You know, Harshana, you mentioned uh, strength and weaknesses earlier. Um, mm. And to touch up on, on, the, on the performance evaluation, you know, it is, it is hard as, as, as a coach, we we'll walk up to, to players and just asking the simple question uh, um, after, after a match. So how did it go? And most players really struggle come come coming up with good performance related answers you know uh, adults usually find find it um, a little bit easier most most juniors usually give me the score which really does doesn't say much ab ab about performance right that's the outcome that's the result but when you know in order to better our games we have to figure out how performance went and and um, it's again with practice with, with, when you come off the court and are you able to tell somebody these are the things that went well these are the things that did not go well and and being in the middle middle of a match it, it, it can be challenging to um to evaluate yourself and there are so many emotions um that, that there is that anxiety you're focusing on, on, on playing the game. It, it, it is hard to have that realistic evaluation of yourself. Um, and, and you have to be open, open to, um, to, to hear what other people have to say who have a little bit different perspective of watching you from, from the outside. Um, and, you know, take, have, have, take, take, take something away from it. And this is mostly from, from our juniors listening in. Um, you know, make, make sure you don't just reject your parents and say, no, this is, this is not true. And my parents, they don't know anything about tennis. Uh, find, fi find uh, I don't know, the 15, 20% good thing in there that, that can be useful for you. you know, I and usually when you're, something sorry, like just to jump on that. Usually when you're on court, sometimes as a player, we don't see certain things. And someone from outside could see better. 
uh, there'll be so many times like you might you might come out of the court and your dad or mom would see something that you never saw yourself while you're playing it's so hard to see while you're playing um so it's yeah, i'd say it's an important point to take feedback from anybody and yeah because it's every little thing matters and tennis is such a broad broad skill type of a game that every little thing can add value to your game and i think in adult league tennis and this is for for the adults here um, there, there is usually somebody out there who is watching your match. And you can even ask them before before the match. You know, it's like, tell, tell, tell me one or two things about what you say. Or you can give them more specific instructions. You know, just say, say that I feel like, um, I don't know, my second serve doesn't have much oomph on it in the second set. Ask, ask them what, what, what they think when they watch so they know they might not watch it super carefully. And most, and if they are not coaches, you know, they, they they will they might not be able to give you a really good detailed feedback feedback, but they can probably say one or two things about about what they saw about your second serve in the in the second set. And I think going back to what we spoke with Rachel, I mean, answered Rachel's question about how you can practice some of these mental skills. Um, going back to meditation, if you are if you can really control your mind when you're playing a match, like really control it in, a, in the sense that nothing can distract you, like people coughing, whatnot, nothing bothers you. That's you meditating while playing the match. So you are in a meditative state when you're playing the match, right? I mean, there's so many different types of meditation. Like for me personally, I meditate when I'm playing the match because I can, I can, I can take everything out of out of my head and really only focus on the match. Nothing outside is going to come into me. I can control it. So I think practicing that would really help you focus and really realize some of the things that you've never realized before because um, you're really focused in that and being in that moment and you're letting the past go by everything in the past, let go and really take the positives and move forward. But if you're always getting mad, if you're always getting negative, it's so much harder to, uh, harder to, uh, you know, evaluate yourself and see certain things that's happening in the match um, and to really uh, problem solve. Um, so yeah, going, going back to meditation would, would really help in a match if you can be in that state where you're very focused and nothing from outside is going to affect you. And that's a, that's a skill to have too. It's going to take quite quite some time to build that match in, match out. You got to keep the focus, um, but it's definitely going to help your game. You know, it's going to help you really problem solve and understand and realize some of the things that are happening to you and some of the things that your opponent is doing to you as well. So, Harshan, I watched you competing quite a few times now. Um, and... You have the ability to get into that what people call a zone or a flow. Mm -hmm. Like, can 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 you talk about like how long did that take you to get get there as as a as a player, or or how some something that would help others to develop their skill because that 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 is a skill that is a competitive skill, mm -hmm. and and that's what everybody's trying to do. You know, to be in that zone when you can really perform your your best. And, yeah. You know, and it it is ins inspiring to to watch you competing, um, because you are able to have that. What one of the books um, described as the effortless effort, and that's what we are trying to do. Mm. We are trying to be loose um, and relaxed on the core, especially with the upper body. But you want to give the best effort. So can yeah. can can you talk about that? Um, a bit? First of all. I was a train wreck when I was young, right? I used to throw rackets. I broke multiple rackets in my lifetime of tennis. Um, and my mom has grounded me a few times because I was breaking rackets. Um, so I've, I've been through that whole cycle. So some of when, when some of these kids get really mad, I mean, I can really relate to it because I've been there and it's, it's a tough, it's a tough one to get out of. Um, but I think as I matured, when I was like 15, 16, I told myself, you know, I'm going to forget about the result and uh, I'm going to try my best to like not get mad. Uh, that was my only goal, right? Lose, win, 
it didn't really matter at that point i knew that you know i had to get over this hurdle um so i simply focused on not getting mad sometimes i would sometimes i would come out of the match and i don't feel any i have no emotions and i'm like uh, i'm not sad i'm not happy i'm like oh yeah that's that's how it is but later on as i kept doing that i was able to control the match more and i was able to really uh play play use that to my advantage instead of just just you know only focusing on not getting mad then i was then i could focus on not getting mad and also focus on playing my game and uh, there'd be so many times i would i would have situations where you know i mean i'm i'm on top of the point and and somehow the other guy defends well and and i end up losing the point and it can be disappointing but at the same time i'm i'm thinking it in a way that hey i did i played the point well uh but uh, i'm not i'm not getting mad but it was a process it took me probably like i would say about 5 to 6 years to get very good at it and be be able to get in the zone like pretty pretty easily and going back to talking about strengths and weaknesses and i'm and i think i'm very i'm very very clear about what i can do and what i cannot do and especially when i'm playing a match i try not to do things that i can't do um so i'm very focused on doing everything that i'm capable of uh, to my best effort um so i'm not trying to do like anything anything crazy anything fancy and every time i do something out of out of my league out of what i'm capable of i realize it and then i quickly switch back to doing what i'm good at um i mean it's it's easy to say but it takes it takes a lot of practice um and again it all starts in a practice 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 court you know even when you're even when you're practicing when you're rallying you can build these habits you know it's it's tennis can be very frustrating because you got to understand how the game works um it's never about it's never about the total points you win it's all about when you win the points um i mean in other racket sports like squash and um, badminton or something it's all about how many points you win but tennis it's not there's so many so many times you can reset after every point you reset after every game you reset after every set you reset so that resetting helps you in tennis to really you know calm down and really focus on focus on your game because uh, good losing 4 5 points in a row doesn't mean much it can be frustrating losing 4 4 5 points in a row but that doesn't mean that you're losing but if you get that to get the mindset of oh i i lost four by four five points you know and i'm losing that's that's going to really affect you so um it's about i think it's just really knowing what helps the most is knowing knowing your strengths and weaknesses and the kind of shots i'm i'm capable of doing and also knowing if something's not working what adjustments do i have to do to make it happen um because i'm constantly thinking about how can i make how can i make this adjustment how can i do this how can i do that then about oh how do i win this point uh, usually usually if you're focusing on the process focusing on the things you you can control points usually happen uh, but after you get to a certain stage you can make it happen as well first i think it's important to really focus on controlling yourself if you can control yourself the next level is being able to control the opponent because now you're very very steady with controlling yourself controlling emotions controlling your decision making uh now yes you can adapt your decision making to play your opponent uh but yeah those are different different stages i think i think number one is to stop being getting mad and stop being super negative about yourself uh i mean anything we do negative energy is bad um so everything we do we are always trying to create create positive energy as much as possible um uh, but yeah all of these little things i think help uh in match and the funny thing that's why i started talking about meditation earlier because my coach um he's big into meditation and he was telling me like do you ever meditate i said i never do but he said do you know what like you when you play tennis match you're meditating i'm like oh wow i never thought about it that way but he, he said that's the time you meditate he said you don't meditate outside of tennis court but on a tennis court you're meditating because you're really focused and that's part of meditation too and like yeah that's that that's true you know so i mean i mean some people some kids i mean most of the young kids here i mean when you're studying when you're really focused and that's that's kind of meditating because you really streamline your whole focus into uh doing that that whatever work you're doing uh, on that at that time so different people meditate in different situations 
you know uh, i mean sometimes driving you know when you're when you're driving same thing you you you're super focused at all time um so different you know everybody's different i mean for me it's just i'm i'm really kind of in a meditative state when you when i'm on a tennis court and that took me a while like a long time and let's let's take this this last question um do you have a tennis book um that you recommend Any tom <laughs> we got tom here come on um, he's a world renowned author i'm sure he has some books to recommend <laughs> No, and and any any tennis book. Uh, I'm I'm thinking. I mean, a couple of things that come in mind. I, I mean, most of the tennis books I have, they are really not fun reading material. You know, they they're a little bit more like textbooks than than um, than something you would read for fun. Uh, from Andre Agassi, Open was a book, although it has some adult. Parts, I would say uh, so. Probably, I would recommend if you are 16 or older. Um, there are some parts that were more for grown-ups, and there is Brad Gilbert had a book called Winning Ugly. Um, you know, it talks about the the, the mental part. Uh, Racket. What is that, Lillian? Well, Lillian showed a book. They they were showing what something. A racket. The book called Racket. She yeah. thought you guys didn't see it. I saw it. <laughs> there is, there is probably the, the best-selling tennis book of all times is, is the Inner Game of Tennis. It it was written in the seventies, um, and again it was probably written more for grown-ups than kids. Um, but it gets into the into the mental part of of the game. The whole idea behind the book that when when you play, um, they it, they're like two personalities. When people talk to themselves, sometimes in their head, sometimes out loud, like who is that other person? And it describes as like there is one one self, one personality that um, that's like really conscious. And thinking about it, here's my technique. I have to take the racket back high, then I have to drop, then I have to bring it forward. And there's the other self that's just kind of doing things. And we try to, to allow the personality, the self that's just doing, that's just flowing on the court and not let the other one get into our heads who is like really self-conscious of who's watching me. What is this other person thinking? Oh, uh, am I moving my fast enough? So that 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 was a really good book. Um, I'm thinking, may, may, maybe something interesting. I mean, there are some some other books on the mental um, aspects of sports and generally performance that I found helpful, even though they did not mention um, the word tennis in it. But just generally reading about performance, um, I, th I think is 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 very interesting. Um, it's like almost an hour or past an hour. Uh, before we wrap up, I think all the questions were asked by all the adults. None of the kids kids asked a question on other than Vincent. Vincent, Vincent had, had a follow up question to one of the one of the questions we were answering. I think we need at least one question from from the little ones. Come on, guys. Give us one, one of you. You should have at least one question. There's no way you guys have no questions. I see Philip thinking. I <laughs> see it in his eyes. <laughs> Come on, we're not we're not strangers. All of the, everybody in this call are from sportsmen, so you're yeah, not a bunch of strangers. You, you know, there's nothing to be worried about. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa is like someone asked us to say something for the team. It could be you, Vanessa. Come on. I need one question from the kids. One. Oh my God. <laughs> How do you figure out your strengths and weaknesses? Good one. I want to ask something. 
something and say something for the team. That's our question. <laughs> All right. Good question. Good question. Um, how do you figure out your strengths and weaknesses? Good question. How do you figure out your strengths and weaknesses? Think of the different types of shots you have in tennis. Right? I mean, serves, forehands, backhands, volleys, slices, you name it. Right? And if I ask you, what's your strength? Okay. Majority of the time, a lot of people would say a forehand. Right? And then I'll ask you the follow-up question saying, what type of forehand? There's so many different types of forehands, right? Is it a topspin one, a flat one, a hard one, a slow one, an angle one, a deep one? I don't know. You name it. And also it depends on what kind of ball you receive, right? And you got to be clear about what kind of ball do you like to, to be aggressive or to attack. And if you're pretty clear with that, when you're playing the point, you're constantly trying to force your opponent to give you a kind of ball that you like, right? So that way you're mostly thinking about creating the situation for yourself than really thinking about ending it, right? Many times you guys get quite carried away with ending the point before the point even started. Um, so really be, try to think for yourself, figuring out what kind of shot do I like? I mean, all of you guys have favorite shots. You know, nobody has to tell you. All of you guys know there are certain shots that you like, certain shots that you don't like, and and think of the shots you like, and think of think of what kind of shot do you like, and that'll give you a quick, quick, like a how do you say a path to uh, to to when to do to use when you're playing points, just to be clear about okay, I want I want this kind of ball. For me personally, I want a ball. That's in the middle of the court. That's a little slower. So I can use my forehand to be aggressive. So when I'm playing points, when I'm serving, I'm looking for that first ball in the middle. When I'm returning, I'm trying to return down the middle to get a, get a ball back in the middle to, uh, to attack. When I'm getting a forehand, I'm trying to hit it high and heavy, deep to the backhand to get that ball in the middle. So, and when I'm when I'm when I when I get a low ball, I, I slice it deep to the backhand corner and trying to get that. So I'm constantly trying to create that ball that I like that I can attack, and that should constantly work in your mind at all times. Especially where, as Ruth said earlier, when it comes to tiebreakers, those are the kind of plays you want to do. Tiebreakers, you're simply forcing your opponent to give you what you like. You know, uh, I mean, within that process, you might win some points and lose some points. That's okay, but that's your goal. When you, when you, once you start getting that ball, now you're trying to dictate, now you're trying to win the point the way you want. But until then, you're being patient. You're moving your opponent around, pushing him back, pushing him forward, giving him different kind of a ball, a slice, a topspin, an angle, and really trying to create or force them to give you the kind of ball uh, you like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and and some, sometimes it's natural, you know, you don't really think about it, but you realize while you are playing that every time there is a ball in the middle of the court, you're going around it with a forehand. Every time you win the toss, you say that you would like to serve or, or return, right? And, and you kind of re realize that because you feel more confident do, do, doing those things. And, and that can guide you with like, okay, I can build my game on 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 this serve or on the forehand or you don't just have to think about shots you can also think about footwork as as a strength um and you can build your game on it while you are trying to strengthen the your your weaknesses um and um and yeah so some sometimes it, it is it is really just naturally evolving for players um, but for those of you, we have a fairly, among the juniors, we have a fairly young crowd. Um, our hope is that we give you all the tools, all, all, all the tools, and um, probably by age of 14, 13, 14, when, when you really have a strength. And, and hopefully at that age, you can, you can focus on, on on having those strengths and building your strategies around that strength, but not really have holes in, in your game. So you would be a more complete 
full chord player, which takes a long time to develop. Cool. Any more questions, little ones? No? Who asked that question again? Let me see. <laughs> I think that that was oh, uh, Winston. Winston, yeah. Uh, here's an, an, an other book. Um, pretty much everything that we do as sportsmen in terms of like programming is based on this long term athletic development book. Um, it's not something for you to read, but they, it gives away lots of reasoning of the different stages stages of development it is not a tennis book it is it, it was made for sports in general sports performance vanessa good one if someone were to have a negative mindset on court how do you think it would affect them as a tennis player it would affect them very negatively <laughs> that's number one <laughs> right if you have a negative mindset on the court it will affect you very negatively um i mean think of it in a way like you're always you're always telling yourself how bad you are even if you win a point right that's how that's how the negativity can really affect you like you might win the point and you might think like oh i just got lucky on that point i didn't really win the point and you're constantly putting yourself down but but that is that's that's really going to affect you as a tennis player um but really when you win points you got to keep telling yourself hey i'm winning points and i can win more i can and i can do better i can still do better than what I did the last game. And if I lost the last game, no, I know I can win this point. Remember that positive self-talk is really going to help you and try to really be good at talking to yourself in a positive way in the match at all times. Never talk to yourself in a, in a negative way. Win, lose, it does not matter, right? It's a process. Just like you learned your forehand and backhand, it takes time for you to practice these mental skills as well. And really talking to yourself in a positive way throughout the match at any moment, even if you're two points away from losing, is going to help you win in the long run, for sure. It's a fact, right? So you wanna make sure that you cannot, you cannot let your negative thoughts take over your mind. And most of the time when your negative thoughts take over your mind, you can't think straight. You wouldn't know what's going on in the match and you wouldn't be able to execute the plays you wanna execute, right? I mean, I can give a simple example as when, we, when we're doing practicing, you're doing, we're doing serve and volley in doubles and you're serving and volleying and missing and you're getting frustrated and then you're, you're telling yourself, I'm so bad at serving and volley. You might still make a couple of good, good volleys, but you're still constantly focusing on the mistakes you do as opposed to the good shots you hit, right? And, and you will make mistakes when you're younger at any age, at any level, everybody makes mistakes. So you got to accept that it's a part of the process and you can always make it better. Remember, when you make a mistake, there's nothing worse. You made a mistake. You can only make it better moving forward. But you can't make that mistake a worse mistake. It's, it's, it's a miss. It's, it's a simple thing. But you can easily make it better. So, But if you keep telling yourself that, oh, I can't hit this ball, I can't get it in. No, it's, it's, you, if you can tell yourself that you can't get it in, you will not get it in. But if you tell yourself you can, you will find a way. And you guys know the subtle adjustments you got to do, you know, keep it above, uh, like uh, over the net, nice and clean and get some spin to get inside the court and stay away from the lines. Those are very simple things that you can use to get the balls in. But if you stay at that negative, you will always come into, tro come into problems. And remember, as we spoke earlier, if you cannot control yourself, you will not be able to control your opponent. At this, in, the, in, in this situation, if you're super negative, you're constantly dealing with yourself. So you, you're basically losing the match yourself, right? Your opponent doesn't do anything. Your opponent's just putting balls back. You're just killing yourself mentally and that's going to affect your play like very badly. So you want to make sure that, that you should not let that happen. Winning losing, is, winning, losing is something you can't control all the time, but you can always control having a positive attitude. And as we spoke earlier, attitude and effort, those two things you can control. But... Um, being negative is, to your question, being negative is definitely going to affect you as a tennis player, 100%. Marshana, let's, let's have a conversation about doing a part two of this. Yeah. And we went way, way over time, but it was a really good conversation.
it was really nice for everybody to come and join and and I think most people stay stay with us all the way through. So thank you. Um, next yeah, time I can awesome. wait for Philip to have a question. Um, you guys should have questions like that. Come on, write it down and ask. Yeah. I want more questions from you guys. I'm sure you you guys have lots of questions. It's just a matter of you guys are just uh, shy to ask. I have a right. question. You had a good question. What, like an hour ago? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank right. you, Arshana. That was great. No. Thank you, guys. Wow, thank what you. is that? What? Bye. All right. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.